What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh, Rebel Radio is going down. What do you say? Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What's up, Rebels? Welcome back to Rebel Radio, the weekly show where I bring you the Rebels who are shaping our culture. I'm your host, Josh Levine, and I have a great interview to share with you today. My man, Persue, from San Diego. Uh, he's a graffiti artist, holding it down there for a long time. We've worked together a little bit over the years, and I'm a big fan of this dude and, and everything he's doing. So in addition to you know his, his own work under the name Persue, murals, all, all that stuff, uh, he's also created a character called Bunny Kitty which is kind of an anime style character that he's built into a brand with clothing, uh, with a book, some other fun stuff coming out that he's going to talk about. And it's, it's amazing what he's done with that brand. And if that's not enough, he's also created another brand called wet paint, which is a project of collaborations that he does with other artists. Um, and he's just got some great insights into, the idea of brand building in this space and how he's creating and managing all this at once. He also, he started his career as a designer at DC Shoes, um, you know, one of the first skate companies uh, out there and, and shares some great lessons about that. And um, it's just, it's good stuff coming up with Persuade. I was hanging out with, uh, you know, my crew in high school and this guy was Filipino. And so, you know, we, it was only a matter of time until we met him and he was, he had the black book and I asked him what it was and he, he opened up the book and he was like, well, this is my Bible. And it was full of like every single page was airbrushed and design marker, like beautiful burners, you know, like really futuri futuristic styles. And I had never really seen it right in front of me before you know like in person and i think that just with the timing what was happening in music and i was getting into skateboarding and when i saw that it just clicked and i was like i want to do that and that night after knowing him only for a few hours we went out that night with a van full of friends and wreaked havoc all over the freeways and um nice. suburbs suburbs of san diego <laughs> what was that feeling that first night loved it yeah. but i was frustration too because i was such a toy that i couldn't get the paint to do what i wanted it to do what my mind was thinking yeah i couldn't make the paint do it sure so yeah i mean i, I mean that, that takes that's the work right yeah and i think naturally like i'm a little competitive with myself and so um it was like well i'm gonna get better at this yeah. and so i completely like just head first into it yeah i've heard people i think i think you know we had saber on the show um, uh -huh. I think he talked about you know from that first time like feeling kind of an addiction yeah i think that's i could relate to that and it was just from that day on it was like i was doing okay at school but after that i was it was i was drawing on the desk yeah. i was drawing all over my homework but i've always drawn on my homework um i stopped doing homework i start, started playing hooky from school to go jump in my friend's car to go look for graffiti around san diego in the pits mm -hmm. and look for other writers and stuff like school was like out the window for me at that point um so uh yeah it completely took over so i could agree to that addiction kind of feeling yeah I get it. uh saber on another level i mean that guy i mean what a what an amazing career oh, yeah, and uh, sure. an amount of body of work that he's done illegally and legally just yeah yeah real, real, real individual yeah so, uh but you weren't thinking of it as a you're, you're not seeing it as a career at that point Oh, not at all. Uh, I I had um, I was going to join the Navy because I wanted to get out of San Diego and I wanted to see the world. And it just so happened. Uh, I mean, I was doing some pieces. I'd already been taken on like as a, a, a an apprentice for a, a graffiti writer, a, a king down here in San Diego. He goes by the name of Quasar. Mm. He was already really established and he saw the uh, potential in me and kind of pulled me under his wing and got me away from a lot of the like bullshit like 
that was happening, like uh, with tag banging and all that stuff. And it made me real focused on, uh, you know, stylized, you know, like getting better at style and techniques and going out and painting and traveling and um, connecting with other like-minded individuals, mm -hmm. you know, like really opened the door for me to that, like the insight. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what's the second part of the question? Well, I was just wondering at, at what point does it go from oh you, we're making we're making money yeah making so, money or or feeling like this this is what i'm gonna do for for my life I, I think it was well for me it was when i met ken block on a phone call uh, i was painting a skate shop and I, I wasn't getting paid i think they were giving me like clothing or a deck or something i got a full deck for painting the skate shop uh -huh. and, uh, ken block uh this guy the owner was buying eight ball at the time and was like hey you know there's this t-shirt company called eight ball and you know maybe they'd be into working with you and um i called him and he was like well if you draw something up on uh, and uh you know send it to us and if it's good we'll put it on a t-shirt yeah. and I, I love that idea i love like having something like oh it's just another area that i haven't touched at the time and i was young i, was, I think i was 18 or 19 and uh, I gave him that design on a Subway napkin because I was making Subway sandwiches <laughs> at the time. And um, the t-shirt went uh, did really well. And uh, so that led to him buying all sorts of art out of my black book. And it was a, a really nice check for the time. Sure. And I was like, oh, wait a second. Like, uh, I think I got something here. And I called the recruiter up who was uh, recruiting me for the Navy. I had like one signature left to get into, you know, just like my placement, you know. Yeah. And um, I called him and I, I told him, hey, I'm not coming to the Navy. I, I've got another calling. And he was like getting real pissed off and hostile at me on the phone. I was like, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. Wow. And so I found myself working in the warehouse uh, at Eight Ball, and then we had just started to launch drawers, mm -hmm. and then we launched Dub, and then we launched DC. So I was the founding artist for all those brands while moonlighting as a graffiti writer, which was amazing because skateboarding, you know, they have these quotes like "graffiti saved my life" and "skateboarding saved my life," and I think both of those kind of like uh, industries uh, really had a lot to do with shaping me to who I am today. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I, I had spent decades in the industry building brands. Yeah. It was kind of like the man behind the man in, in so many ways, you know? Yeah. What, tell, tell me about that, um, you know, working with Ken and Damon, um, you know, obviously now we know the history of DC and how, you know, the massive influence they've had on culture. Yeah, big time. Um, what was it like uh, working with those guys? What would you learn from uh, them? Oh, a lot, man. I learned a lot about marketing, a lot about production design and development, being finished, um, having an idea and seeing it all the way through, right? Yeah. Uh, so this opened up the, uh, you know, that it educated me like hands-on, real-time on how to, you know, uh, be a part of a company. Uh, and the first time I, I worked with them a couple times, almost three times. Mm. Uh, the first time, like I said, was like uh, around 92. And I worked with them for a couple of years before they let me go because they only let me go because I didn't know how to use the computer. <laughs> and the computer, the personal computer and the graphic design was so new. Crazy. And uh, they needed someone, like Ken needed somebody to like, help him with the workload because it was getting busier and he had all these brands right yeah. and he was really the graphics guy he was really in charge of you know the the visual and, and the overall aesthetic of those those brands um where damon was doing a lot of the clothing design and development mm -hmm. for them uh so they let me go and i went to go work with tony magnuson at evil and Nico at Evil and learned the computer. And then a couple of years later, they Ken called me up. I think it might have only been a year later, called me up when uh, he had hired an Aliasha from Fat Farm mm -hmm. in Mecca. Mm -hmm. And they were like, hey, you know, we'd like to have you come back up and interview. We really like you as a person and your, you know, what you've brought to the table in the past. And 
the company is different from what it was when we first started. So why don't you come up and interview with Ollie? And so I did. So I met with Ollie and, and Ollie looked at my work and he was like, you're hired. And that was it. So I came back to DC and worked with Ollie again from like 90, Five ninety six until 90, 98, perhaps. I think Ollie had left there to go do alphanumeric, and I stuck oh, right. around for a little while longer, and then I left there to go start Circa. Mm -hmm. So, but I learned I learned a lot from Ken and Damon. That, that They were great managers and bosses to work under. Uh, they had a, a really strong vision for their brands, yeah. really focused, and I think that we see that still today echoing within the ethos of DC, even though they're not hands-on involved sure. uh, anymore. Yeah. You see everybody kind of looking back at the era of when we were doing it and, and the influence we had on the market at the time and what made it so cool mm -hmm. was that we were these kids that designed all this stuff and made all this really cool product without anyone telling us what to do. We just did it, you know? Sure. Yeah, that's so, huge. Um, I think that helps with the success. I mean, first of all, how funny to, uh, you know, it, just the thought of like not knowing how to use computers now is like yeah. so crazy, right? Yeah, and I was a little embarrassed. I was pretty, pretty sad with the day I came to work at DC and the warehouse manager had a check for me. And mm. I just remember being just emotionally, an emotional wreck. Of course. And, but I, I had a job in the next four hours when, you know the company is you know when tony magnuson heard i didn't have a job he was all he just swooped me up yeah so i was really fortunate in that in that light there wasn't a, a lot of graffiti writers at the time or people that had what i was doing uh it was like a handful of us right so like uh it wasn't really saturated there weren't like a lot of people on computers yeah, and of course. all this stuff but it became um an industry standard in a sense you know that to hire a, a graffiti writer to you know make your brand look really cool totally yeah. um what do you you know graffiti and skateboarding both are like you know like they, this well they, yeah and and you know i think what they have in common is you know these underground movements that now are just global you know right. sort of mainstream um, yeah what do you think What, what's that done for the culture? What, what do you think is the, the, is there a downside? Is it, is of it, creating an industry? Well, just of, of kind of where it is today. <laughs> I think, uh, well, I think it's like for, for a graffiti writer, I think we look at it as like, well, who's paid their dues, right? right. Who's actually put in the work? And with technology, it's it's it blurs the lines, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's hard for us to trust the movement in a sense unless you're being vouched for. Right. Um, as far as the industry, us creating an industry, I thought it was exciting times because I think that my generation helped spearhead that as well. Absolutely. Um, I don't know, you know, if it really helped anybody. I think, no, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I, I don't know if there was really like a royalty program in, put into place, kind of like how skateboarding um, was, you know, like the skateboarders really kind of take care of each other. Right. I don't know if there's a brand out there that's actually putting royalty checks or money into these writers' hands. I don't know because I'm not sponsored on that level, sure. but. Um, sure. The free paint is always a, a gift and a, and a blessing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, except that when you have to move studios or your collection, it's a curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. But it's all the things that we, you know, growing up. Oh, wouldn't it be great to have a uh, a video game, a graffiti video game? Yeah. And then Mark Echo makes one, and then uh, I found myself. I bought it and I played it, and I was like, wait a second, I do this shit in real life, like. <laughs> <laughs> Why the fuck am I playing a video game? <laughs> right. That's hilarious. But it was a rap video game. It was cool, but, you know, I, I would rather just really go out there and paint yeah. myself yeah. instead of virtually. Um, I think also what the what uh, the Internet has done is blurred the lines of cultural, like, kind of aesthetic and styles, whereas, like, 
Philly has done a really good job at creating a bubble around their aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? With their wickets and their tags mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas like graffiti letters and styles, you know, you have people uh, in Asia that paint like people in LA and yeah. vice versa and all that stuff, and which is part of the evolution of it. But I think that we eventually see individuals that rise above all of that, that have a unique style and bring something new to the table. So, you know, that, I kind of straddle the fence of like whether, you know, what we've done is good and bad, but you know, it's just part of the evolution. So you just kind of ride that wave, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, personally, I. I, you know, I think it's amazing. I think that, yeah. you know, to see art come, you know, literally from the Bronx in East L.A. into it, yeah, you know, every corner of the world to see um, the, the diversity, not just of, of artists, but of art, you know, that you have yeah. people like Shepard who take the game in a whole different direction, right? you know, with some good and bad attached to it. But nonetheless, right, that creates... It creates opportunity. Yeah. It inspires, you know, next generation. Um, yeah, you know, which I it think art cultures, really brings cultures together. Hundred percent. You know, um, hundred percent. I've traveled the world since the '90s and broke bread in farms of Vietnam and and you know under bridges of uh, in Korea and yeah. Uh, yeah, daytime illegals and stopping traffic in China. You know with writers and it's all incredible. that stuff and, you know and then just it creates a rad network you yeah. know of, of friends around the world globally and then we have each other to turn to for sure most of the time you know um yeah so 100 percent, man yeah it's been it's been awesome yeah so um one of one of your projects uh, uh, bunny kitty um how did that which which i think is you know I mean, I love the character and the, the, the storylines. Um, Thank you. Um, how does, but, but it's so unique in your body of work. Um, it is far away and far removed from all the skate and hardcore work that I put in through the years because it has a very kind of like soft look to it. Totally, yeah. And very, you know, uh, cute. Right. Uh, so 20, 20 years ago when I developed the character, it didn't look cute at all mm. um actually i want to say i have a drawing of it right here oh, cool. yeah somewhere i just got to find it it's somewhere in here it's the first drawing of bunny cutie here it is oh wow that's so different so, isn't that different yeah this is 2001 i that's a picture of me the first time i painted it wow that's awesome and, and at that point, I didn't think like, oh, well, I want to turn it into something. And I, right. I, through the years, I, I want to say I'd already been in the skate industry for over 15 years. And it had so many brands that I had touched that had been successful and done really well. And I had a lot of people asking me, like, well, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Like, when are we going to see a Persuade brand or right. something like that, right? Yeah. And I think it was just... I had drawn this picture and then I was like, oh, I'm going to draw it again. And um, it got a little bit more cute mm -hmm. as I went on, on with it. And I was like, well, what if I created a story around this? And what if I created products to accompany that story? And I could create something because I, I grew up in a time when everybody was talking about how negative graffiti was and how we were all, so, you know, gangsters yeah. and tag bang and all that stuff. And okay, yeah, we ride parallel and there's a part of that that is, is true. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a lot of positive things that we do as artists and as graffiti writers as well um, that I think that the media at the time really didn't understand. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so my retaliation to them was bunny kitty mm -hmm. in this mindset that i was going to create something so positive and it, it would come out of graffiti uh where in the end like i could be like this whole like you know nana, 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 nana type yeah type thing you know to go against 
everybody that said that graffiti was negative and really like what Bunny Kitty has done is touched so many people's lives, you know, of all ages. And it's been kind of like a really cool thing to be a part of sure. and to, to be, you know. So um, Bunny Kitty's led to a lot of exciting things, um, a lot of things that I never really saw happening. Um, what, what do you mean? Well, you know, traveling and doing street art events, um, doing, a, I had a show in Shanghai that was uh, a mix between two different IPs that I have. One is uh, Wet Paint mm -hmm. and one is uh, Bunny Kitty. And so like I, I was able to build out the entire, this entire building uh, into a Wet Paint Bunny Kitty experience with inflatables and a New York subway station and oh, that's cool. and stuff. Yeah, it was over the top. It was crazy. And so I never really saw that coming, even though like it was something that I've always wanted to do, but it happened. So um, it, it's been in the works for a long time. I'd written a, a book, The Origins of Bunny Kitty. Mm -hmm. um, for the people that aren't familiar, I never, I never thought that I would be an author in my life. It's like the last thing I thought. <laughs> the origin of the bunny kitty I wrote with my late mom. She helped me edit the story and she wrote the magic spell. And then I hand painted all the pictures inside. Cool. Um, yeah, it's awesome. This, yeah, this is the first adventure book of Bunny Kitty. And, and since quarantine, I've sat down and I finished the first draft of the, uh, the second book where it gets a little bit more... Uh, raw and it's aesthetic and i introduced villains and oh, nice. uh, different parts of a story that aren't in the first one so um yeah but to go back when i first started bunny kitty painting it in the streets i mean i was painting it next to revoked pieces and rhyme pieces mm -hmm. and my pieces and wayne and all these people people got behind me but there was a group of people that were like oh persuades bitch made you know he's putting flowers next to his graffiti but like <laughs> i didn't invent that i really saw that from the smurfs and yeah there was a crew out in uh a writer out a writer or a crew out in denmark toys mm -hmm. and i always saw him put flowers around his pieces i thought it was real dope you know and there's nothing there's nothing uh soft about flowers we need flowers in order to sure. live on this planet man yeah. so like you know i don't know what people are saying so so that was that was many years ago and you know time's gone on and i've i've proven to myself i guess that there is a space for bunny kitty in the world you know it's change is hard right if, for artists, you know, people expect to see you do the same thing that they've seen from you before. Yeah. And, uh, and but it's interesting you say that, you know, you kind of had to see that for yourself. I did. I did. And it, it was difficult because I, I questioned myself already as a, a creative. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear certain things about something you love, uh, from people that you want to respect, yeah. it's um, it's kind of a tough pill to swallow. So, uh, uh, does, does that ever end the questioning yourself? No. <laughs> I feel that I've gotten more refined as an artist uh -huh, and in yeah, my sure. aesthetic and, and my approach. Yeah. But uh, I mean, fortunately, my fiance is there to be like, "Hey, babe, no, this is really strong work. You're 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 badass," yeah. you know, or. I, I would maybe add something more to it, never really harshly critiquing me, mm -hmm. but like subtly like giving me insights. And there's only a handful of people that I open up like that to. Yeah, of course. I count them on one hand. I imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so when when Buddy Kenny kind of starts taking off, like, how do you, how does that change things for you as far as? Um, because it's one character, right? And then you do other, you know, you have other work, other projects outside of that. Bunny Kitty is a cast of characters. So there's um, 28 characters in the, oh, wow. in the Bunny Kitty universe. Amazing. Um, in the first book alone, I probably tell the story of uh, six or seven of those characters. And in the next book, I add another six or seven. Mm -hmm. And then there's all these characters in between that I'm trying to 
fit into the stories as I go. Oh, cool. So it's a vast, it's a vast universe. As far as like developing characters, like if you wanted me, to, hey Dave, could you take these glasses and make a character out of them? I could, I could do that for you. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, I do that still. You know, like outside of Bunny Kitty, I'll create different characters and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, with wet paint, it's been a nice escape from Bunny Kitty, even though like she acts as the mascot for that uh, that movement. So yeah, talk um, talk about wet paint a little bit, how that came together. So wet paint is the painting of graffiti on these MTA signs that I found while taking the uh, train to my studio in Red Hook mm -hmm. in New York. So I was living in New York, and there's these signs that the MTA makes and uh, it was part of their campaign during uh, the fight against graffiti and it still is since sure. the 80s and um, people have taken these and made artwork out of them but not in the in the same vein that I had yeah and uh, or maybe they have I, I want to say actually I showed a piece at the museum we had a wet paint show at the beginning of this year um, and there was a piece that Dr. Dax gave me to show of Stay High. Mm -hmm. And that was dated 04, I think. And so, like, he was, I mean, he was the type of dude that was just kind of grabbing. He would grab things and write his name on it. And he was hustling. And, yeah. I mean, I bought a, quite a few little canvases on uh, from him back in the day. You know, like, he would show up at a wall and have a, a stack full of Stay High canvases. And everybody would crowd around him and, you know, 20 20 bucks a pop oh, that's cool. you know? so i was real fortunate to meet him and yeah. and, and get that and also show a, a, a stay high wet paint sign in the show mm -hmm. um but we turned this into kind of a, a an ongoing traveling show that i curate with uh, my buddy wayne cod in the bronx mm -hmm. and um we invite uh, our peers our graffiti friends our street art friends our our designers to have a crack at this and then um we have art shows and do product design and, and drops like clothing and hats and stuff like that, very limited amounts. And we, we've done, I want to say, six shows. So we've done New York twice. We've done um, Tokyo. We've done China, Shanghai, mm -hmm. uh, Philly, of course, and Miami. And we were in talks uh, to do uh, a few more shows, but everything's kind of on freeze, obviously, at the moment. Yeah, so I'm just kind of curating a future show without any real kind of like solid plans. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it's been uh, it's been a great ride. It's funny that uh, this whole wet painting's kind of exploded the way it has, and it's just. It's one of those things, it's like, you know, when you get an idea and you have this intense idea and then you know, like, okay, what steps can I take to get this out there to people? And for wet paint, it was just a matter of inviting those people that I've been, um, either like grown up with or uh, wanted to collaborate with through the years and reach yeah. out to them. I found that a lot of them were really supportive and, and into backing us uh when it came to the shows and, and stuff like that so it's been a it's been a great success i mean i love that that idea it's so like it's so simple and yet you know it really like you know to me one of the things that's so interesting about graffiti is how much collaboration there is yeah um and you know oftentimes that's these huge murals that are really involved and like and you're presenting a platform that's that's you know so easy to to get artists involved and, and uh, yes. continue growing I, I think it's brilliant thank you uh, appreciate it it's funny it was like uh the um uh, it took a lot of uh struggle to get to that point to find <laughs> something like that you know that right? uh, because I, I had i had was living i was born and raised in san diego i live here now again but I had moved to New York to do to try to get the Bunny Kitty book off the ground. See, I had the writing of the of the script of the first book sitting in my computer for eleven years, mm. and it wasn't until my mother came down with Alzheimer's that I and, and I lost my job in the industry and I was living off unemployment. Where I was like, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it now. Sure. And then I had to 
invite from some friends out in New York to try to make the move easier. And why don't you come to New York? It's the place where creative thrives and fine art thrives and stuff like that. And so I put everything into storage and uh, had very little to uh, little money to my name. And I went out there and I took a chance. Yeah. And made the sacrifices of leaving my seven-year-old daughter at home mm. uh, to prove to her that sometimes in life that you have to take these uh, or make these sacrifices in order to get your dream and in, into a reality. Absolutely. Without any promises, sometimes you know uh, it. It's really it was really stressful. I, I attribute most of the gray in my beard to the experience in New York. <laughs> And, and real winters. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Being a San Diego kid, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh, in the in the end, you know, Bunny Kitty rose out of that, and um, it, it it was initially very well received. But it took me still a lot of work to travel and do comic cons or design cons and book signings and workshops and elementary school readings and library readings all sorts of stuff in order to share bunny kitty to a handful of people at a time right wow uh and i think it was my mother's passing that helped gas and fuel that and knowing that i needed this as a way to heal from that yeah. and um also uh you know in order to prove to my family that I wasn't just twiddling my thumbs what? and myself. I mean, that's uh, those are such big life lessons. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you carry those? How do you use those lessons now as you as you go forward? Uh, it's nicer to know that I have things that are a little bit more rooted and people are behind. You know, sure. like that. I really have like really loving bunny kitty fans and i have people that really love wet paint or both and vice versa or yeah. one or the other whatever um and i just apply what i've learned through the years of the in the industry and uh what i've learned in the streets and um i just apply that you know and uh i try not to overwhelm people with uh asking them to purchase things all the time i only make the, you know certain items at certain times within my means mm -hmm. yeah. you know i'm i'm my own there's it's like a two person you know i uh company you know like i'm me at the helm and then my fiance helps and of course wayne helps with curation and, and insight to stuff right um but in the end it all falls on my shoulders and so like um you know i just kind of uh you know, take it take it real serious, but at the same time, I I, I, I try not to make it seem like you know I, I'm here just for your money. I'm I'm also here for your entertainment sure. and for a, sure. a distraction from all the shit that happens in our lives, right? I mean, to me, that's that you know that's that DIY ethos, mm. the way that that Dub and Drawers got started, right? Like, yes, it, and I think that's why I relate so well to the. Um, to skateboarding cultures, you know, yeah. uh, and also even gang culture in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> those those three graffiti gangs and and uh, skateboarding kind of ride those parallels, you know, all together. Absolutely. Especially here on the West Coast. So, yeah. I mean, for people maybe out east, they never really got the whole tag banging thing like that. Didn't exist out there, you know. Like people got jumped for their paint, right, and stuff like that, and beat up. But, um, I mean, you got fools being murdered on their doorsteps yeah. uh, down here in San Diego and, and sure. different places, which is a damn shame, Absolutely. you know? That. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. What, um, what, where are you looking for inspiration, kind of, you know, on, on the new stuff that you're doing? I think, uh, well, with um, with my stuff, it's like life imitating art. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the life I've lived with uh, my family, my friends, my experience of traveling, 
how extensively um, the lessons I've learned along the way, my vivid imagination and uh, being caught in daydreams. Um, I think daydreaming and dreams have a lot to do with it. Sure. Uh, sure. Um, I do, uh, you know, once in a while I'll do psychedelics just for my mental state. Nice. Uh, for meditation reasons, not for reasons of being high, but for, you know, asking the universe for help. And so how does, how does that, can you see that in the art afterwards? Yeah, there's a aspect of Bunny Kitty where it's a dream state. And so in this aesthetic, you see a lot of floating elements mm -hmm. and mushrooms and magic. Mm -hmm. So when you see that, like, um, you see that like there's the dream state of Bunny Kitty and she's like a little bit more of a time traveler in that sense. So like in this spread right here, you see oh, the, cool. Daisy the cat without the suit dreaming, but the dream is like a future kind of like characters yeah. and happenings and bullies in the next book. So like these characters that are in this painting, like this one, this one, oh, wow. You know, uh, a few of them aren't in this book. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't read about this character Rilla in this book, mm -hmm. you know? Like, you read it in the next book, but this gives you a little insight of what to come, what's to come. Yeah. So there's, like, you know, the, the whole mushroom play and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, for this particular book, I, I micro-dosed during the entire painting of the, uh, the pictures. Not saying that the pictures are super psychedelic, but maybe right. they, it kind of helped me get um, what I wanted to convey through the pictures and the layout of the of the book. Yeah, uh, because I was so afraid of doing the book. Like I said, it took eleven years to get around to it, so I didn't even know what approach to take until the shit hit the fan and I had to do something. And so I committed, and that's that's the commitment. There is, is that is that book. So, so how does that, how does, you know, the, not, not just the success of that project, but the, the risk that you took, like, how does that impact the other things you do in art and work? Who, um, I think that it, I mean, it helped that it really worked and that it was well received. And then also that wet paint was well received as well on the, uh, coattails of Bunny Kitty. Um, I don't think if uh, if Bunny Kitty worked, I would be sitting here talking to you about it. I don't know what would have happened to me. Sure. Um, I think uh, I would be painting still, uh, but uh, now I found myself in a situation where like I still need to elaborate on these stories. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I don't know what how long Bunny Kitty will go on for. It's already been twenty years. Yeah. Um, I may, you know, I'm always telling my my one of my daughters is that hey you know i could leave bunny kitty to you you could run it as a business it does make money and maybe you could take it further than i've taken it Amazing. you know um and uh, that's a cool so, idea i don't know i don't know that we see a lot of family art businesses well, you, well you, i think when you i think of it i see um you know mark Baudet and von Baudet. you know that relationship between mark and his father mm -hmm and his father teaching him how to draw Cheech and, and the lizard while Mark was still an, uh, an infant sitting on his father's lap. Oh, wow. Tell, telling him stories. And so, I mean, this is this, this is from Mark's where, you know, this is what he told me, is that his father taught him how to do it, you know? And That's so cool. Mark grew up to be an artist and worked for Teenage Mutant Turtles and did all this stuff, but at the same time kept his father's ip intact and kept it alive and i think that's a beautiful thing you know if you could do that um Absolutely. i don't frown on that I, i've heard people say otherwise and i was just, i was kind of appalled by them even having the idea of like well it's in the dna right like yeah. we're made up all, all this ancestral dna through the <laughs> it was just handed off to mark to, and he had the ability to do it and to do it really well so like I think that's a commendable thing and I think he's done I, I think it's it's a great look yeah um, you know because what comes after Mark 
you know, it, it's gone. Sure. Right. Yeah. And uh, because his daughters don't want to do it or his, you know, there's no one that's going to pick up the pencil after him. And uh, I think uh, we see it also with family trusts or, uh, you know, um, estates, mm -hmm. right? So like uh, if I leave it to, if I leave Bunny Kitty and it's all the paintings and all the drawings and the, the books and all the product or everything to my family and, and 20 years from now a museum or somebody discovers Bunny Kitty and, and maybe they see the importance of it Yeah, that uh, oh we want to show that and so they, they'll contact my estate so like uh, I'm hoping to leave things like that for my family but I'm trying to teach my daughter like well if you apply yourself and learn about sales and marketing and all that stuff you could be not only because she wants to be an artist, oh, cool. you know, paints and stuff like that. Well, yeah. please learn about business if you do that, right? Yeah. Like, know a little bit about business. <laughs> what, what, are the, what are the pieces that you, um, that, you know, you're trying to show her or that, like, you wish you'd known at the beginning in terms of the I business think side? learning how to protect yourself with contracts when people want to get in bed with you, you know? Yeah. Uh, what you're bringing to the table and what that means on a piece of paper mm -hmm. for the future, how many years that, you know, what kind of scale that looks like and yeah. what what's the takeaway from it. I think it's also like how to protect yourself, uh, copyrights and trademarks and understanding like how that works yeah. and, and taking the, if you, if you take your work very serious, uh, like I do with Bonnie Kitty and Wet Paint, I, the first thing I did was trademark it. Right. You know, yeah. before I had anything, uh, just to kind of like use that as motivation of like, well, I spent the money. I might as well try to see this thing through. Absolutely. Right. I mean, so, I think it's so interesting. I was actually, I was talking to someone on a, a, you know, another interview recently on the, on the music side about how, you know, so many artists don't fully understand the business side. So they kind of shy away from it. Yeah, and that's like the opposite of what you want to do. Is like I don't fully understand this, so you want to like really kind of over protect yourself, right? Sure, you kind of need to get in the face of it, yeah. and sometimes it's a deterrent for companies. And I've seen it happen; it's happened to me, where like they won't, you know, want to work with you in the future. Or <laughs> is that right? I mean, it's happened to me. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely I don't know think why, but... uh, I've seen some of that. I've seen some, you know, again, just like the artists. I mean, this is good because it means people like me have careers, right? Because there's, there's an artist that can make the art, but they don't understand the business side. There's people on the business side that don't understand what it means to be creative and to bring something into the world that didn't exist before. And right. so, um, you know guys like me get to kind of translate and bridge that gap and that's cool but obviously artists need to know i think on both sides you, you know they're both sides benefit from a better understanding of what your partner is going through and what's important to them absolutely and that way you guys you guys can truly be in a sound uh business together yeah right when everybody's on the same page it makes you feel uh, like you can sleep at night yeah i mean presumably you, you want um you know, you're going into business with a creative person. You want them to win. Sure. Right? Like, you know, otherwise um, just buy a finished piece of art and don't ever talk to and the that's artist. It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So wh what are you, what are you most excited about next uh, in terms of art or, or anything else? Oh, geez. Next. Um, I think getting the, the, the next Bunny Kitty book, uh, illustrated and the campaign together for that um, and releasing it to the public yeah. um, and announcing that I, I'm ready to drop the next book um, I, that's not for I mean it probably won't be for six months or so before I start doing that mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of things on the table with wet paint but they're that are all now frozen. But I think what I'll do is uh, put together a, uh, a small curated show for an online uh, art show. Cool. Um, 
but that has yet to be kind of uh, figured out and done. So sure. um, I don't know, man. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's it for me. It's it's mostly revolving around um, the Bunny Kitty book, and then you know creating some new paintings in the studio. So nice. just take time to do that. Yeah. Are there are there young artists that you kind of have your eye on? Oh, geez. Uh, I think that I'm really into female artists, mm. you know, and what they're doing. I really love Keratos, you know, like I love her work. Uh, Lauren Yes, of course, Amanda Lynn, Gloria Muriel, um, Carly Ely from San Diego, uh, Musa, you know, from, I think she's from Spain, mm -hmm. Matt C. Mm -hmm. There's a really a lot of powerful female artists. No, I mean, that's, that's uh, so great to see. Obviously, uh, art and graffiti, you know, specifically has been so male-dominated for so long. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, no, it's great to see all that happening now. Um, Absolutely. The, the female powerhouse, you know, like it's really cool to kind of see that rise to the, uh, through all the bullshit. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, I got to do a little lightning round before I... Uh, let you get back to work. Um, oh God! Okay, <laughs> that's right. We cut out the uh, the pauses, so take your time. Um, what's your favorite city to travel to? Ooh, Vietnam. Oh, nice. Never been, but uh, amazing. I've heard it's amazing. Amazing food. Yeah, people are got huge hearts, man. Nice. Who's your favorite yeah. DJ? Ooh, DJ. Cuber. Yeah, Cuber, it's incredible. Um, the, the way that dude changed the game is so real. Yeah, it's from another fucking time zone. Or right. not even time zone, <laughs> just mental. Just like, just another... Just somewhere in your mind that people don't really tend to turn on, Absolutely. you know? Like, the ability to see... Uh, to see colors and music and stuff like that. Totally. It's no different totally. from what, you know he's doing with with records yeah. right oh, it's his, instrument. Right. his instrument yeah what uh what's the last great book you read <laughs> oh it was a uh, holocaust survivor um i i usually work on drawings and stuff while my fiance reads so i technically don't read them myself okay uh it was uh oh shit man uh I forget. It was just a story of uh, Brian, uh, David Ferber uh, was the survivor, and it was just a story about this young boy that that survived this, losing his family and wow, Holocaust and seven years of this war in Poland and like how he just kind of barely made it through, and it was a promise to his mom that he would survive, and he did. Yeah, and he, you know, right. So Crazy. that was the latest. And know. so she reads while you're painting. Yes, oh, that's good she's stuff. that she's that sweet. That's amazing, dude! What a what a great uh, partnership. It took me uh, forty something years to find it. <laughs> Unbelievable! I love that. Um, yeah, man. If you could wake up tomorrow having gained any quality or ability, what would it be? Oh wow! Uh, the ability to fly. Mm. Hell yeah! But, I'd fly right on out of here. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, and last thing, if I work for you, what's something I would hear you say over and over? Bunny kitty, bunny kitty, bunny kitty. <laughs> it's probably what you'd, you'd hear from me the most. Like, this guy and bunny kitty. Oh my God. I love it, man. Kill That's me. what it takes. That's what it takes. You know, like, hey, you know, look at the guys that created, like, Snoopy and, like, I'm not saying that, like, I'm Schultz or Disney, but I created a character I believe in, you know, and that other people Absolutely. believe in. So that's enough to fuel me to continue doing it. So um, uh, it's just a part, of, a part of me and my DNA. So, you know, I, I see the positive effects it has on people, so it makes me feel good and it keeps me going. So. Absolutely. Wow, I love kitty it, all day. Love it. With Thank it. you, man. I appreciate appreciate the time, Josh. Dude, this is so much fun, man. I appreciate you uh, sharing your, yeah, your wisdom with us. Um, 
Thank you. Definitely want everyone to check out Bunny Kitty, check out Web Paint, check out Thank all you. of Persuade's artwork. Um, and we'll be watching for what's next. Good things. So. Yo, that was Persuade on Rebel Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. You can hit us on Twitter at Rebel Radio Net. Facebook, same thing. Um, love to hear if you got some ideas for upcoming episodes, if you got questions, whatever else you got. Hey, there's music in this episode, courtesy of White House Music. We had tracks from Throwdown and KOH. Hope you enjoyed those. And most importantly, next week, come back for more Rebel Radio. <laughs>